So uh, let's continue with the eyes. The, uh, from the very beginning, since the very beginning, even from the 16th, 17th century, they noticed that you could see with just a magnifying glass, you can see a person reflected on the right eye very clearly. See it? Not yet? Not yet? Not yet? How's that? Slightly better? Okay, now you have to. There's a white line around. <laughs> Sorry, I'd love to do that. <laughs> okay, now we see here the, uh, the image of a person reflected. And you can see this with just a magnifying glass. You don't need any special equipment, anything uh, greater than that. The, uh, the, the image is reflected on the, the cornea. The, one, the image that you can see with just a magnifying glass is reflected on the cornea. In 1975, Dr. Graue, using an ophthalmoscope, which is, uh, some of us are old enough here to remember. They had this little lamp, ophthalmologists had this little lamp that they used to shine in your eyes and they would flick three times a disc, changing the lights. Today we just use a computer, we sit, we put our chin on there and then look at a picture and the computer does all the work without us seeing. The, this is still an ophthalmoscope. So he uses a, a handheld ophthalmoscope uh, with, the, with the eyes, knowing that there was already reports of, a, um, of an image reflected in the eyes. What the ophthalmoscope does, the reason why it changes the, the flicking, or today the computer changes, is in order to analyze the images inside a three-dimensional human eye. The, uh, the images are reflected in three points. According to the laws of Purkinje Sanson, we see how the first image is reflected on the cornea of the eye, the second one is reflected on the retina, and the third image is reflected upside down in the crystalline, in this sort of lens that we have inside our eyes. Applying the ophthalmoscope to the original, to the image of Our Lady, this is what he found, that there are three images reflected on the eyes of Our Lady. Number two is upside down, that's why it's so hard to make out from here. However, the images in the eyes of Our Lady are exactly as a three-dimensional living human eye. If you take an ophthalmoscope to any painting, you will not get this. That doesn't mean that the, the, um, the eye changes, the iris modifies according to the light. I've heard a million stories. Um, she does not have blood flow. She does not turn her eyes to look at you. Uh, she doesn't react to sunlight or to light. It's a miracle enough to know that the image is that has the images, has the reflection of the images of a living three-dimensional eye. It is impossible for us today to do it on a fabric like this. Now, having heard this, in 1979, Dr. José Astetonsman, he was, he led the NASA team that uh, scanned the surface of Mars. They did this in order to find if there was life at one point in Mars, if there had been water, if there was any, any sort of uh, traces of life. So he was an expert. He is, sorry, he, I just killed him. No, no. He is an expert on uh, computer scanning. And he scanned the eyes on the, on the tilma. Now, the, what he observed was only the images reflected on the cornea. Here are the, the eyes, and this is what he found. 
the uh, little cross that you see here, that's the cursor of the computer. Somebody once yelled out, look, she has crosses in her eyes. Oh, God. No, 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 no. This is the cursor of a computer. Okay? And then we see here, there are 13 people reflected in the eyes of Our Lady. The biggest image, the, big, the one that we can see clearest is this one here. We see a native sitting down with his legs one leg in front of the other. We can see here the foot, the knee, the other foot, the other leg, the knee, the shoulders, the head, and his arm. Next to that, we see a man who is uh, an older gentleman with a full beard, straight nose, European nose. This man, three quarters. Then we have another man here with a piece of fabric tied around his neck with his arms extending. The eyes of every single person are facing this way. This is a, wo a black woman. This is a Spanish man. And this is a family group. We see a woman standing with a child on her back. We see another child standing in front. And this is a man with a sombrero. Now, if we take out all of the extra, uh, the round, the area around, you can see them a little clearer. And if we add a touch of color, sepia, then you can see, it get, you get a sort of a three-dimensional effect that's a lot clearer to see. Now, let's analyze each one of them. We begin with a man, a native, he's dressed as a native Indian, with something on his back that is perfectly round. Now, that is not a human head. It's too circular for a human head. That tradition, that has been identified as a rattle. They have, um, they used to have the rattles for dancing. So they would use them in the rituals. The, uh, we see here that he has the front of his head shaved. Converts were shaved in order to distinguish them from non-converts, from the rest of the native population. We see how he has a sandal. He's wearing sandals. And even the fact that he's wearing an earring. He's got his hair pulled back. The detail on the sandal that we see here, we can even see what type of sandal he's wearing. He has one strap that goes along the top, a center one, and then one that holds the toes. Just to give you an idea of dimensions, this strap that we see here is four microns in width. You take one millimeter, divide it into a thousand, and that's a micron. Four of those is this width. Today, with all of the technology that we have at our disposal, it is impossible to do that here. And yet, there she is. You can see the shading as well. The type of sandal that is viewed is tradi was traditionally used, exactly the sandals that were traditionally used by the native Aztecs of Mexico. The position that he's sitting on, I've been asked several times as to why sitting on the floor if he was in front of the bishop. The position, was it degrading? Was it, you know, demeaning to the natives to be sitting on the floor? It was their custom. This is the goddess of flowers. And she's sitting in a similar position. She's being depicted in a similar position to that of the native that we see. <coughs> it was neither demeaning nor uncommon for them to sit in such a position. This is an artist's rendition. 
Now you can see that it, he took a few liberties with the, with the painting. You can see that the straps are not here. There's a couple of details that... Um, however, this gives you a very good idea of what you're looking at. For those of us who are not computer experts, you can now see him very clearly here. Next, we see these two faces. This man here, bearded, heavily bearded, with a very straight pointed nose, with a, um, you can actually see a shaved head here, a tonsure. Some of us have it naturally now. Back then they used to get them shaved. The Franciscan friars, all of the priests were, were shaved. That's why they had the soqueto to cover what used to be the tonsure. What do you call the soqueto here? There's another name for it in the US, in English. Sometimes skull cap, but the skull cap. usually it's soqueto. The skull cap, thank you. Skull cap. That's the one. I've heard. It's just that some people, when I say soqueto, they look at me like, what? Skull cap. OK. We see here a painting that was done by um, Miguel Cabrera, the one that did the painting of Juan Diego that we saw. And we see here Bishop Fray Juan de Sumarraga. And that's the image. That's the artist's rendition. Now, one of the things I don't like about this artist is that he painted Richard Nixon. <laughs> And no, he didn't. That just looks, it just turned out that way. But I know. <laughs> but anyway, aside from that, it just gives you a better image, a better frame. Now, don't start saying that I said that Richard Nixon was present at the miracle of Our Lady of Guadalupe. <laughs> don't you get me in trouble. I get myself in enough trouble. <laughs> Anyway, we see here how um, the bishop. This is Juan Gonzalez. We know that the translator that was there, his name was Juan Gonzalez, and he was, the bishop spoke no Nahuatl, and Juan Diego spoke no Spanish. So we know that there was an actual translator, a very holy man. And we see them both right there. Now we have this image of a man with a cloth tied around his neck and a, and a cone-shaped uh, hat with fabric, a piece of fabric extending. You can see where the fabric ends and how he has it extended in his arms. He's got the nose of a native and the high cheekbones and the hat, the cone looking hat. We can even see the knot of the fabric. And the very, the, the, the um, bone structure of a typical native American. The, uh, the, the nose. And these are the two side by side, the two eyes. OK, I'm not going to comment anymore. The, uh, I've had questions about the fact that he was wearing a conical hat. Um, that, of course, this one looks a little bit a leprechaun or a gnome. But uh, conical hats were, uh, conical uh, headdresses were used commonly. Even to this day, they're still being used. And if you look at, a, at one of those sombreros that are, that are uh, famous around the um, Independence Day, uh, you can even see that the center is usually a cone. It's traditionally a cone. So we see um, an emperor, one of the gods, and a member of the aristocracy all wearing that style of headless. And you can see that here. 
Now the woman here in the back, we know that the bishop had a um, servant, girl, woman, who came with him from Europe. He left in his will a, um, a rent, a lifetime pension for her. So we know that uh, there, in fact there was a black woman that was with him on that day. And that's the entire group. Just to give you an idea of dimensions, again, this is the center of the eye, the pupil. What you call the apple of the eye? This is it, where the family is located. And this gives a better idea. And here's the family group. We can see the two children here. Now, another woman and the child on the back of this woman. You can even see the head, uh, the, the, uh, the way her hair is done. This was typical of married women. All married women would do their hair up. Okay, this is the right eye. We saw the left eye, this is the right eye. And you can see the images. They look very different. Well, not very, but they look different. She has her head turned to the side. So the reflection on the eyes would be different. And they are. And they actually correspond to a living human three-dimensional curved eye. The deformation that we see of the images actually follows the contour of a, of a human eye. We see that the Indian that was sitting down, we only see his head here. We see the two heads of, of the two men that were here sort of fused together. The image that we identify as Juan Diego sort of blends in the background. This is the, the, uh, the image that we see of the man uh, on the outside of the eye with a magnifying glass without any assistance. We see him a lot bigger here and a lot more detail. And the family group is actually two families. It's two groups of people that are together there. This man that we see here, he has a full beard. We see that his eyes, nose, his beard, and he's got his hand actually under his chin. The cuff of his shirt is ruffled. And then we see how the coat that he's wearing over the shirt, it's tight on the, on the, um, on the wrist. And then he's got a balloon sleeve. The typical attire of the Europeans, of the Spanish, of the 16th century. The family group in the middle, this is the, the, uh, the drawing that we have by the artist. We see that it's in both eyes, the very center of both eyes. Now, Dr. Tonsman did an exercise, being a man of faith, he is a man of faith. Being a man of faith, he, he took out the, two, the family group, and then with the two eyes, fusing the two eyes together, he found that the shadow of the silhouette of Our Lady Guadalupe is cast down on the family. When she consoles Juan Diego, she tells him, are you not under my shadow and protection? The family is directly, the most innocent one, the children, directly under her shadow and protection. So she is present at the moment of the roses. It is her image that is imprinted on Juan Diego's tilma. Of course, she's present but invisible. Now, um, today, Our Lady of Guadalupe today. Today, we have her at the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. She's there. Waiting for you. you know, she's there. 
for ozone. There are 13 masses said every day, every hour on the hour. There's adoration. There's all of the sacraments. She promised to remain and to bring us to the God giver of life. There, this is the most second visited shrine in the world. 150,000 people per day. On December the 12th, from the 11th to the 12th, we get 7 to 10 million people visiting. Pilgrimages from all over the world. The faith from all over the world. John Paul II, in 1979, in the, docu in the closing of the Synod of Bishops of America, in Puebla, wrote a pastoral letter called Ecclesia in America, the Church in America, naming her the star of the new evangelization. He's telling us that we do not need a re-evangelization. We have the revelation of Christ. We have the Gospels. We have all of that, what we have forgotten is that we are called, each and every one of us, to bring that message to the world. So she is the star of the new evangelization. She brought about the conversion of nine million people. When there were four million Protestants leaving the magisterium of the church, leaving the sacraments in Europe, she brought nine million people to the fullness of the faith. So she's, he, uh, John Paul II reminds us, names her the star of the new evangelization, and reminds us that we are the ones who have to bring this forward. No longer sitting down on the sidelines, no longer afraid to be politically incorrect by bringing the gospel and the fullness of the faith. Uh, Benedict XIV, when he was um, elected Pope, right after the ceremony, after as soon as the smoke cleared, everything said the dust settled, the incense was gone. He went down to the gardens, to the Vatican gardens, and there he composed a prayer and consecrated his entire papacy to Our Lady of Guadalupe and asked her, she said, onto your maternal hands we place our lives. As the prayer that he composed says, as once before you did in the land, in this land, obviously he was not talking about the Vatican, in this land, as you did once before, we place our lives in, onto your hands. Sometimes people have asked me, oh, so who do you say, did you say painted this image? There, I brought you a picture of the author. Just if there's any doubt as to the origin of the image. Any questions? Yes. It's an Arab word, yes. Why, why do you think that one was like There was a, uh, well, the, Arab, the translation of the word is magnificent. It's the river of light of love, the one that, um, the one that directs the light of love. The, 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 it, it's perfect. But the bishop was from southern Spain. The, um, he is from Extremadura. The monastery of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Spain is in Extremadura. He recognized the name immediately. He asked for proof. So Juan Bernardino says Guadalupe, Juan Diego brings the roses. So he gets two, as if he needed something more than the image appearing before his eyes. But um, Juan, Diego, Juan Bernardino, the uncle, is the one that brings the name. And then he didn't know. And then he wouldn't have ever known, never heard of. So he would recognize that name immediately. Juan Diego's uncle, yes. 
Juan Diego hadn't seen his uncle since he left him when he was sick. So he left, left to fetch a priest. And from there goes on to see the bishop. So he had not seen Juan Diego. And then Juan Bernardino comes and tells the, to the bishop the um, Santa Maria de Guadalupe, the full name. Nothing more? No more questions? Not only the earth goddess, but every pregnant woman, yes. But then you said that the image there's two, four loops. And yes. So what's the significance of four The four elements, the creation, the creator. She's pregnant with the god of, uh, of all creation. The entire image, absolutely everything, speaks of the, the, the fact that she brings the god of all creation. The entire image is Christ-centered. All of the message is Christ-centered. What she does is she takes all of the elements that the natives understood to be God and then focuses them on the Gospels. So what she does is she makes the perfect inculturation. She takes what uh, Father Paul Popar has called that uh, takes the truth, what the, uh, the uh, Second Vatican Council said, takes the light of the gospel, takes the truth, the seeds of the gospel found in other cultures, and then leads them to the fullness of the faith, leads them to the sacraments. So she not once uh, says that they are evil, what the priests and what the Spaniards were saying. He doesn't say that they're satanic. She, sorry, she doesn't say that they're satanic. She doesn't treat them in any way with oppression, with violence, with aggression, in no way. On the contrary, they had that enough of that with their old gods. So she actually turns the whole thing around by giving them respect for the roots, the, the, what, what they understood to be rooted. The Spanish, when they were conquering, they were tearing off the roots. They were telling them that everything that to them was significant and had a deep-rooted history in their lives had to be abolished. They told them that it was a lie. They told them, they ridiculed them. They told them that the, that, um, the devil and the demons had made a mockery out of them, had made fools out of them. And then Our Lady brings using the elements that they understood to be good and tells them it is, okay, they were worshiping creation, not the creator. And that is what, using all of the elements that they understand, their good intentions, that's what she uses, the goodness in their hearts, and then brings them to the fullness of the faith. That's why it's so, the message that she brings is valid to us today. We read it and we feel the same consolation. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not in the crossing of my arms, in the folds of my mantle, between my, between my um, under my loving gaze? That's where I want to live. I mean, that's exactly the most beautiful image of a mother and child. And then she brings us completely to Jesus, to the sacraments. Yes? Now, no, 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 May 5th, uh, no, May 5th, no, nothing at all. I don't think he even chose that date, it wasn't him. No, it, uh, please, no, please, please, please drop numerology. Do not go there. Somebody told me last year, 
this is going to be the most wonderful feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I'm thinking, what? why? Well, I was in California at the time. I was in South Salito with, uh, doing this exactly thing with, on the feast day. Just on the feast day. I said, but it's 12, 12, 12. Oh, for the love of God. No, 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 no. Trust me, this is not the first 12, 12, 12 that Our Lady has had. And trust me, it's not the last one. So don't, no, 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 no. No, numerology is, uh, no. That's looking down on creation again. That's thinking about creation rather than the creator. Nah, doesn't work that way. And the millennium, no end of the world. Mayans don't know the end of the world. Nobody knows the end of the world. So. Now, that's, that gets a little, con somebody told me once that um, there's 49 stars, there's nine flowers, there's uh, nine flowers of each type. There's one, uh, now we are lean, obviously. But people were telling me, what do the numbers mean? Uh, don't know, don't, I have no, no, nothing. Yes? No, they're all multiple people. Not, there's not only Juan Diego. No, I separated the, the, well, the author separated the images to analyze them individually. Okay, so with the multiple, then, that was in the presence of the only presenting That's the scene we're looking at. I mean, normally I don't say, come out and say it like this, because we try and keep a certain uh, objectivity, I can't. I can't be objective, or a lady of Guadalupe in general. But that's exactly the scene we're looking at. Everything that we see points to that moment. I mean, a man dressed as an Indian, with a feature, with the physical features of a Native American, with a piece of cloth, spreading it in front of, a, of uh, two Europeans, and a whole bunch of other people, an African woman. It's, it, it speaks of nothing else. So she's present at the moment of the miracle of the roses, which is the imprinting of the image. Imprinting, there is no brush stroke. There's not a single brush stroke in the entire image. Now, if you've heard that the paint is floating above the fabric, that's a lie. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, that there's body temperature, that she has body temperature. That, no, that's wrong. Um, what else? Oh, heartbeats. If you put a stethoscope and no. Am I, I'm trying to think of what else. There's an email that is being sent out. It's passed around throughout the year, but come December the 12th, I'm just bombarded with it. Look what I found and I thought of you. Th oh, shoot. Yes, I know, and it's wrong. It's, um, oh, I, had, I have another one, that there's a little fetus in each one of the uh, stars. I know. I mean, she's pregnant with our Lord. Don't look for any more uh, babies. That's, I mean, Really, that's more than you need. That's, I, don't, I don't remember anything. I'm trying to think of what else uh, people have said that, it, no, it's incorrect. I imagine there's probably all kinds of people who want to get a closer look at this. I mean, do they have to open it up for Millions, people? and the answer is no. <laughs> After the attempts to destroy the image, no. No, I'm afraid not. No, you, there's only special, you, no, you have to be in with somebody really high up. I have never seen her up close. So, no, not publicly, no. There's, the, uh, there's been, th there were two attempts, so that's enough. Has she ever traveled with her? No, no. Oh, no, Mexicans will not. No, no. You would have a revolt on your hands. The bishop would be strong to <laughs> alive. No. <laughs> no. 
Mexico would not allow it now. Even when um, the Pope, uh, uh, Benedict XIV, in the 1700s, 1745, asked to, um, there was the, the image taken, of course it was a painting. No, no, under no circumstance. Now, the only time that she was removed was in 1921, immediately after the dynamite bomb. She was placed, uh, they, they took the image down, folded it, uh, sealed it, and notarized exactly where she was, and the bishop, Luis Maria Martinez, uh, kept the image with him. And then returned it, and the protocol, every single protocol was followed afterwards to, to, uh, to bring her back to the basilica, but no. No, she does not. Oh, there's the nitric acid. The, uh, they were cleaning the frame. She had two frames, one of silver and one of gold. And the, um, at one point, they were cleaning the, the uh, silver frame with nitric acid. And the man who was cleaning it dropped the acid on the... Um, it tilted. There was no glass at the time. So, sorry, the flask tilted forward and dropped the acid. Normally, if the acid, whatever acid, but nitric acid touches this fiber, it disintegrates it immediately. It has no resistance. It's a natural fiber. It has absolutely no resistance. There is a stain, however, that is, um, that is on the image, on the, on the top right-hand corner. And you can see how the acid it looks like a watermark uh, on the right-hand side. Normally, that would have eaten away entirely. It's actually fading. The image is, the, the stain is, is faded. But, uh, yeah, I would, I would die if I were the guy that dropped the acid on. That's it? Anything else? Two more. Uh, tonight, after 7 o'clock mass, I think it's 7 o'clock mass? Tonight, after 7 o'clock mass, in Spanish? Spanish. In Spanish, and tomorrow morning, after, no, tomorrow, 1 o'clock? 1 15 mass, and immediately following that mass, also in Spanish. I've already, I'm finishing two weeks here. This is my last, what, three days? This is the last of the last, my last, I leave on Monday. Oh, I'm writing a book, but I'm on chapter seven. Please pray for me. I need to finish that. <laughs> I'm working away, but uh, I'm still writing. I've been writing for the past seven years, but uh, I'm still writing. Just so, please, I'm not procrastinating, I swear. It's just, it's a lot. What I'm doing is an introduction, but I'm boiling down uh, 8,000 years of history. And that's not an easy, synth synth synthesis is not exactly one of my strongest points. So I'm inching my way through that. So I, I promise to have it ready. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I said millennium, but <laughs> no, I'm not sure when still. Uh, I'm working on that. I promise I'm working on that. The video that you are now, that is now being uh, taped, is actually got this entire day is going to be available on YouTube in the Oblates channel. So you can watch it there many times more if you want. You can just say that was bad, give your opinion. If you liked it, please pray for me. If you didn't, be quiet. Um, <laughs> no, the, um, this, is, uh, this is for you. This is entirely for you. This is my apostolate. This is what I've been doing for the past 16 years as an apostolate. So uh, this is for you. Sorry? How did I get started? I was, uh, I was working in Mexico and the Holy Father came. And there were pilgrimages that came to see 
the, with one of the visits of the Holy Father, and uh, 1998, I believe, and the um, friends of mine invited me to, well, now friends of mine, invited me to visit in, in them in Edmonton, in, in Alberta, in Canada, and they told me that if I wanted to, to come, come and spend your holidays with us, your vacation, I said, well, I vacation a month. I take one month off out of the year. And they said, okay, come over, but we're not going to have you lazing around. You give, put something together to do a presentation. So I, uh, before panicking, I went to talk to Monsignor um, Salazar, and I asked him for, for assistance. I had already been studying, obviously, before this. And I asked him what to do, and he, uh, he helped me put this together, and it has just grown this began as a, um, a slide presentation, and it's now digital, so it just changes media, but it's, uh, it, I, I just, I had the, uh, the things embroidered, the, ma the dagger made, just slowly, organically, has grown. And I'm, I'm amazed, I'm amazed that I'm here today, I'm still, I went on holidays, and then I was asked to take Our Lady of Guadalupe. And from then on, this is what I've been, I've been able to do. I work in tourism, that's my job. I work in tourism, so I'm not able to be in one chapel with a ministry, because I have to travel constantly. So this is what I can take with me. This is my apostolate. I take with me all over. So I've been in Canada, I've been in, in, uh, here in the US and in Mexico. So I go anywhere I'm invited, that's I go.